So Justin, first of all, thank you very much much for being willing to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. So Justin Kahn is the former founder of Twitch, which got sold to Amazon for a billion dollars, and also the former founder of Atrium, which didn't have as positive of a financial outcome, but I think had a much greater learning outcome, which to me is even more important. So Justin, I want to talk to you about a few things today, but the the first thing I want to talk to you about is feedback. Because I remember there was a time I, I coached you, and there was a I at one point suggested that we do a feedback session between your executive team and you. And I have this whole template for how people would give you feedback, how you'd receive the feedback. And basically, the only reason I needed to be there was just in case you got angry. Because then it's scary. Like, uh uh-oh, what if your exec team gives you this sort of really intense feedback and then you get angry and vindictive? That's the reason they hold back. That's the reason they don't give feedback. So that's really the only reason I'm there. Like, if the CEO gets angry, I jump on top of them and sort of wrestle them to the ground until they, they let go of that anger. But frankly, it never really happens that often. And with you, it did, which is so beautiful. Would you be willing (laughs) to to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so basically the the experience was, right, that we were having an offsite with my exec team at Atrium at this hotel in Half Moon Bay, like a little small, you know, bread and breakfast type of deal. And you volunteered to help coordinate the offsite. And as part of one of the exercises we were going to do, you had accumulated a bunch of 360 feedback, right, from my team that was all anonymized. And we actually went through it before, one-on-one. You were like, kind of, we went through some of the feedback and it was pretty raw, very honest. There were things in there like, we don't think Justin cares about us. He's just using us until we attrit or is or get fired, you know, stuff like that. I read it with you and when, when we were reading it together, I was kind of like, oh, okay, like that's pretty harsh. I don't know if I like accept all of it, but like I, yeah, I can hear it. And then we did this uh, session where it was kind of going over it live with everyone as a way to demonstrate that I acknowledge receiving it and he could hear it. And during the live session, then I started to get defensive, right? I, I think there was live input that people were adding on top of it to give more color to some of the feedback, how maybe I wasn't treating certain people who had just attrited like well, and I started to get defensive. It wasn't conscious for me. You know, I was like, well, that's not fair because X or that's not, you know, that's not fair because Y or it's not true that like, I don't care about people. Like I do X, Y, and Z things or A, B, and C things. And like, you could tell, well, not me, I couldn't tell, but like other people could clearly tell that I was like holding a lot of tension in my body and my jaw. And I'm like, talking more loudly and you paused it. Luckily, I mean, this is why a good CEO coach is invaluable because you, you were actually like, hold on, stop, everybody stop. It is not safe to give Justin feedback right now because he is very angry. You know, and like, you were just like, so stop. So we need to stop giving him feedback. And I was like, what the fuck? I'm not angry. I'm not fucking angry. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, and then you were like, no, you're really angry. And I suggest we like pause. And I'm like, no, we can keep going. And you're like, no, we should just like take a break. Why don't we have a, a break and stop for a second and then I'm like fine whatever and then we go outside you and I went outside and you said you're really upset you know and that's a natural response um, you're you're angry right now but they're not going to respond well like other people are not going to think it's safe to give you feedback you're going to destroy the whole point of this like trust building exercise if you are angry and you don't take this feedback so my suggestion is you work it out of your system because right now you have this stress hormone your amygdala is firing you know I remember very clearly you telling me all this And you have the stress hormone and you need to release it. And the best way to release it is like, you know, do push-ups or yell, scream and shout, break a glass, whatever you need to do. Like I was thinking, and I think I said, I was like, that's stupid. You know, like I I don't need to do that. That's stupid. And then you just took off running down the, you know, 150 foot driveway of this hotel. You just start running. You were like, well, you can't catch me. You know, you're like at least 10 years older than I am, you know. And 50 pounds heavier. And I thought I was like, I was like, wait, he's going to beat me down the driveway. So like my competitive instinct kicked in. I'm like, fuck this. And I start running after you and sprinting after you, barely caught up to you. And then at the last 25 feet, you start screaming like, ah. So I start screaming and like trying to let it out. And by the end of it, you know, we're laughing and I kind of release this tension in the body after, you know, this sprint. But then you're like, okay, you feel better, et cetera. So I felt okay. Like we went back in there and the point is I kind of released that anger and I was able to sit down and hear the feedback, which created an environment where people felt more safe to give that feedback. Instead of being defensive, I could be in their shoes and say, okay, how is this person thinking this thing? One thing I realized I learned from that instance is like, it doesn't matter what's right or not. There's no objective, right? In relationships, it's only subjective. So it's like, I might think it's unfair, it's not right or whatever, but they obviously have that opinion and they have that opinion and they don't think they're wrong about that opinion. And so if I want their cooperation, I want them to feel like they're on part of a team. I want them to want to be there and working on this team. Then I need to do something about to help them change their opinion. There's no right or wrong. It doesn't matter. I think 
for me, being able to step outside of that moment and let go of my anger so that I could approach it with objectivity, like if I don't want them to have this opinion, what do I need to do? Am I willing to do that? It's very simple. It's a very objective set of prescriptions. That was a major unlock for me because then I could say, okay, you have this opinion. I see how you came to it. I want you to change it. So I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z things. And then they're like, okay, if you do X, Y, and Z things, then I will, I will change my opinion, I think. And this is a team that I would want to work on. And I want to give you credit, Justin, because that was the biggest shift I've ever seen in the shortest amount of time. You described it very well, you know, what you heard me say, but from my side and from the executive team side, you went from normal, nice Justin to really in a lot of anger to the point where I felt fear for your team. Like I thought you were going to cancel them all. And you're a big, powerful guy. You could do it if you wanted to. And then all of a sudden we did that sprint and we came back. And you went all the way back to calm, caring, Justin again. And we walked back into that room and the whole team could instantly see the difference. And then they felt comfortable giving the feedback to you again. And you received it with appreciation. And then you did build that circle of trust because they realized not only did you appreciate the feedback at that point, but you also showed them that you could get yourself out of anger. Frankly, it's a very difficult thing to do and you did it phenomenally. So well done. And thank you for sharing it that clearly Right now, that's exactly what I was I was hoping you'd do. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you. It's all it's all you. Well, it was <laughs> mostly me, but it was partially <laughs> you. There you go. So then there's this other thing I want to talk to you about. And that is there's this notion that people have that if I share with others something that's bad about me, that that's that's weak, that my company isn't performing well, I'm not performing well. And if I share that with my investors or if I share that with my team, then they're going to get demotivated. They're going to think I'm a terrible CEO. They're going to lose trust in me. They're not going to want me to be the, the CEO anymore. They're not going to invest in my next round. They're going to quit the company. That's the stories that we tell ourselves in our head. So we often, we hide the bad performance, both from our board and from our our own team. And there was a time when I shared with you, like, Justin, if you want to create trust in people, if you want to create trust with your board, want to create trust with your team, you actually have to show them all the warts in raw form, as raw as you see them. And you're like, man, I'm afraid to do this. I don't know. This is, but, but you leaned into it because we'd already had a few sessions where there were other things that you'd been afraid to do, but you'd gone ahead and done them and it turned out well. So there was a board meeting. I remember it was Michael Seibel was there and Mark Andreessen was there. I forget who else. And you went and you shared about the company performance. And here's what I remember you saying, but I'd love to hear what you think you said. And then I remember what I think the board's feedback was, but I'll share that afterwards. I remember you saying something like, guys, I have no idea if we make any money or not. We don't track any numbers. We have no clue whether or not each customer engagement is profitable or unprofitable or what level, just no clue at all. And, and that, by the way, was further, more than you told me. That was like really laying it out there. Is that what you remember? I, you know, to be honest, I, there were so many tough conversations from that time period. I don't remember it exactly, but I do rem- recall being really honest about like the state of all metrics and the state of like the company specifically I think around margin and customer retention you know we like that which were not good that we knew the numbers in aggregate were bad but we didn't know why and I think I was like just honest like hey these are this is what's happening like this is the state of what's happening and I think there's a something in there of like a lot of times we try to manufacture and like make everything appear good right and sometimes things aren't going good and you can't make it appear good no matter how you try to make, you know, shine it or like put makeup on it or whatever. It just doesn't, it's not, those, they're, the raw numbers are not good. At that point, it becomes very obvious that you have three choices. Probably like one is to lie, not say anything. And three is just to be honest. It's always better to just be honest and upfront about what is going on. And yes. then you'll never have to hide. That's right. And then to me, here was the most remarkable part. Here you share that you haven't been tracking these numbers. So one could argue irresponsible. That's not responsible to not to not know what margin you're making per customer. I remember distinctly, you I felt real fear that the board would lose trust in you as a CEO if you shared that. And then at the end of the meeting, the board gave their feedback. And we, here's what I remember. And we should get Mark Andres on your call to, to, you know, to see if that's what he actually said. But here's what I remember him saying. He said, Justin, that was the single best board meeting I've ever been part of. It's the only time I've ever felt that I'm getting the complete truth. And now I fully trust you. That's what I remember him saying. 
Do you remember that? I don't remember that, but I, I do remember that people felt trust, right? Like after the, I was like, hey, here's the state of things. And like, this is the honest truth about things. Like they, they felt trust. And in general, I think in times when I've been able to be vulnerable and expose things that normally I would be hesitant and fearful to expose, it's always been for the best. Not maybe the financial outcome wasn't for the best, but in terms of the relationship and people being on the same page and trusting you and being able to work together towards a common goal, it's always, it's always for the best. And of course, the financial outcome was going to be the same no matter what, whether you told the truth or didn't tell the truth, because it was just the reality. Yes, right, the relationships, business. exactly. But the relationships were going to be based on whether or not you told the truth. And you did. And therefore, my guess is you still have a good relationship with Mark and with Michael Siebel. Yeah. So that that's a really great point, because like the business, whether I was like aware or unaware, lying or not about the business, like it was a bad business, right? But my relationship with the people involved has been preserved. You know, Mark's an investor in our, our my new fund now, and you know, still have a relationship with all the people around the table. And so, you know, I think that comporting yourself with integrity is always good for you. You know, it's awesome. something like not to be like that. There's no, no cost to sacrifice. I love it. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a wonderful story and example. I really appreciate it. And then the last thing, Justin, I want to talk to you about was the CEO role and the chief of staff. You know, now it's become sort of commonplace. Every CEO hires a chief of staff now, but you were one of the first and you not only hired a chief of staff, but then you realize, well, wait a second, if I hire a chief of staff and they help me do all my work tasks that I don't, you know, get energized by, what about other support teams just for me to ideate better, to get all my personal stuff done just so that I can truly do only the things that I'm great at. A writer who can help me write better and I just have to talk and ideate and they can actually put it all into good writing and easy to read language. So can you please talk with us a little bit about that chief of staff, why you decided to hire one, what the benefit was, and then all these other team members that you think a CEO should eventually have on their personal team? Yeah, so... so I've always been somebody who's been really good at delegating. And, you know, I think that's something that other people have commented, even for like, you know, before I was very experienced at management itself, you know, like kind of the practice of management and people management and kind of growing people over time. I was very good at delegating and, you know, kind of the concept that you have of zone of genius and zone of competence, like what are the things that I'm like good at and how do I partner with people who are good at the things that I'm not good at? Once I was able to break the mold of like saying well, what a traditional job was like believing, oh, a CEO is supposed to do like responsibilities A, B, C, and D, and they have to do them themselves. And I realized more like, oh, I'm just responsible for a bunch of things getting done in the company. It doesn't really matter if I do them or other people do them. So why don't I focus on the things that are my zone of genius and other people focus on the things that they're, they're their zone of genius? It became very clear to me that the set of responsibilities that the CEO responsibility could be done by like one or more people. And so the first thing for me was like hiring a chief of staff. I really like the idea of a chief of staff because I... I'm really good working with other people in close proximity. It, it's some, it's kind of a weakness and a strength. The weakness is I'm actually like kind of a procrastinator. And unless there's some like direct accountability mechanic, I like don't really do things. And so having someone that I show up and work with every day, even if it's someone who reports to me, but I'm like, hey, I said I would do this and I don't want to be the guy who like didn't do the things he said. That was an me accountability mechanic for me. So hiring a chief of staff who could help me with that was like very powerful. There were a bunch of things around like a CEO process that the chief of staff did. So for example, exec team meeting agenda and making sure everyone is prepared for the exec team meeting. It's like that type of stuff like I don't want to do, right? Like I just, so having someone else do it who was my authority, like, you know, that could be helpful. Or doing research on like CEO initiative projects and being the project manager for those things. It's like, I'm not a good project manager, but someone needs to be. So like that, that person can do that. And then once I started with the chief, chief staff and it was really working, it started to be like, okay, are there other responsibilities that I can use like help with, you know, that are kind of CEO office responsibilities. And so it wasn't a full-time role, but we had like various coaches and facilitators who would help coach offsites, right? Like, and that was like stuff that I thought was really important to like help up level my executive team. So like finding people who are like kind of using your coaching me methodology or something similar or like CLG style coaching, I help coach my team members and my executive team members and facilitate their offsites. That was like another kind of set of roles. And then lastly, I had this idea of like a VP strategy or an executive that was just dedicated to helping me think through like the strategic direction of the company. And that was like another set of responsibilities. But that's that's kind of how we, I thought I started to think about like the CEO team is like more than just myself. It's like a group of people who are dedicated to doing the CEO functions, which is setting the vision for the company, hiring the executive team, coaching the executive team and, and setting the agenda for the, the executive team, setting the goals and making sure there's money in the bank. Right. And as long as that got done, it didn't have to be me doing it. I love it. Awesome. And there are two thoughts that come to mind when you say that. One is the chief of staff, you, I, I met two of them, 
we're both relatively young and relatively junior. And that's another thing that I find that many people, when they go to hire their first chief of staff, they think, oh, this person has to be very senior. They have to be in their 30s, if not in their 40s. And because otherwise, my executive team just won't respond well to them. And you went the opposite route. And you also found your chief of staff, I think, on Twitter. So they were fans of you. And I think that's actually really important because it is a fan role. A chief of staff does basically kind of the grunt work in exchange for getting to see your life. They're connected to your email. They sit in all the meetings you sit on. So they they see all the information that you get, and then they see the decisions that you make. They get to see the correlations between the two. I think it's the best training ground for becoming a CEO, but there is this cost. So again, if someone's a fan, they're willing to pay the cost. And if they're not a fan, why would they? So one Twitter, two relatively junior. And yet I found your chiefs of staff to be excellent and to perform very well. And so this idea of needing to be senior, you kind of debunked it. Now, am I making all that up or is that actually what no, happened? That's, that's right. Uh, Jin, who was the chief of staff, kind of like when most of this was implemented, uh, he wasn't off Twitter, although he, I think he w- did know about who I was and maybe he was like uh, a fan, but he he wasn't the chief of staff. First, he became an analyst at the company, kind of like in the you know corporate office or whatever, like that. He was like a, like a business analyst. And then he joined full time and, and became my chief of staff and he's now is a CEO actually he started a company they raised millions of dollars they have like hundreds of thousands of dollars of ARR it's like being you know it's going to probably be much more successful than Atrium <laughs> like so he's gone on to do uh, incredible stuff so he's um, off to the races it's great to see Awesome. I love it. The other thing was that the strategy, sort of the thought partner for strategy and vision for the company, you did have that as an idea. Did you actually ever bring on board someone like that to be your thought partner around strategy? Because that was a really interesting idea. Uh, And I don't know anyone else who's We had an executive team member who was like playing that role a little bit part-time, but um, it wasn't a full-time. We didn't have someone as a full-time role. And that executive team member also ran a department or no? Yeah, he also ran a department. So it wasn't implemented to the way that I wanted to. And it, I, honestly, like, I don't think we were a big enough company where that made sense yet. But if we yeah. had continued to grow, you know, and we're like a 500 to 1,000 person company, that probably would have been the right time. I think so. So if you don't mind, I'm going to have a company implement that role and experiment with it because I think it's a great idea. As long and as they pay me back. royalties for the past. There you go. (laughs) Awesome. Justin, that was it. Those are the things I wanted to talk to you about. That was freaking perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome.